Good morning to all of you and welcome to our panel discussion this morning. Uh, we will be talking about the aftermath of South Africa's recent elections and the formation of the government of national unity. Uh, we have four distinguished panelists joining us today, all of whom have a wealth of experience in this issue. Uh, but before we go to our panelists for their remarks, I would like to remind each of you uh, that these programs, while they're free to you uh, to uh, w watch and enjoy, they're not free to us. And so your support of Foreign Policy Research Institute and its programs, particularly the Africa program, is very much appreciated. Uh, during the discussion, if you have questions, we have a question and answer box at the bottom of your screen. Please put your questions in there so that we don't miss them. Uh, don't put them in the chat box. They might get missed. We will, at about the midpoint, uh, go to the audience for questions and answers. And now, uh, without further ado, I would like to start uh, with our panelists. We have uh, Sa Sanusha Naidu uh, and Peter Pham. Bob Wakesa and Paul Nantulia. We will start first with Sanusha. Uh, we'll give about a two or three minute introduction and followed by uh, former ambassador Peter Pham. Then we'll have Mr. Bob Wakesa and uh, Paul Nantulia. Uh, Sanusha, the floor is yours. Um, thank you very much, Ambassador. Um, it's wonderful to be here. Thank you for the invitation. And also thank you to, to Bob um, for extending and asking me to be part of this panel. I think it's really timely. And let me not uh, go on too much in the introduction. So good day to everyone. Um, I think what's important for us to, to kind of uh, capture from the elections that were held recently in South Africa, uh, both in terms of what are some of the domestic dom uh, dimensions, but also the implications for the foreign policy space, is really to 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 put it into an ecosystem and what this ecosystem means for us at the domestic level. For the first time in the thirty years since we've had uh, the post democratic uh, dispensation, the African National Congress as the lead party in the negotiations, but also in terms of leading South Africa at the domestic level as the ruling party, didn't wasn't able to garner a majority. In other words, it wasn't able to get a 50% plus one. And so that meant that our political landscape kind of shifted with the African National Congress now opening up its, 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 its uh, processes and its engagement on what it now calls a, a government of national unity. At the same time, I think the opposition party, which was the Democratic Alliance, hoping to actually uh, move further in terms of deepening its electoral footprint and also becoming not necessarily uh, saying that they would actually uh, unseat the ANC at the top, but really to push further in terms of where they needed to be in terms of where we are now, a kind of minority uh, government of, of, of what we are seeing. Um, is able to now be part of this government of national unity. So there's a bit of an interesting uh, issue with the, with the lexicon that we have right now in South Africa is whether we call it a government of national unity or a grand coalition. And so at the moment, it's the, it's the way that uh, uh, engagement is, is, is structured based on the strategic intent document, which governs the relationship in this GNU, which comprises of... Um, the ANC as the uh, and and the DA as what we see as major uh, actors, with the ANC um, being a little bit more because of its forty over forty percent at the polls. The DA at around about twenty, just under twenty three percent. The Inkata Freedom Party, which is really I think an important actor, which should be given note in terms of this architecture, uh, with regard to the fact that it is a kingmaker in KwaZulu Natal, for instance. And how it plays that role in terms of the ruling, uh, the, the 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 kind of co uh, government of, of of provincial unity there, and then of course we have uh, other smaller parties that are joined. Uh, including the Patriotic Alliance, which has a very interesting and a very animated leader called Gaten McKenzie, who you'll see in the media all the time. And then, of course, smaller parties like the Al Jama, Good, and others. I think what is also important to bear in mind is that this election also reconfigured our opposition landscape. For the first time, we have a party who is in 
uh, parliament now considered to be and labeled as and identified as the official party, which is the Imkonte Sizwe party, which has come with all its controversies. Uh, the fact of the matter is that uh, the former president, Jacob Zuma, had endorsed this party and lent his support and came out last year in December to say he cannot vote for the Ramaphosa ANC. And it's very important to understand that he's not saying the entire ANC, he's actually uh, uh, categorizing this ANC in a particular way. That party did really well, got almost 14% um, of the vote, 59 seats in the National Assembly, uh, was the the the, the real uh, uh, winner in terms of the numbers, but didn't make a majority as well in KwaZulu-Natal, which is a strong base. And most importantly, I think what we have to understand is that that plays an interesting dynamics at the at the domestic level. Internationally, I think the question is, what is the continuity of our foreign policy engagements? We have a new minister who's young, uh, who has been the for former minister of the justice uh, constitutional affairs portfolio. But also the question is, will there be a sense of the continuity we've seen in South Africa's architecture of its foreign policy engagements. Where does the Africa policy fit in? Uh, now that we know that South Africa, together with the AU, are members of the G20, uh, it hosted the BRICS summit. Uh, it was part of the whole expansion of the BRICS. But the question is what we will see as some of those contextual uh, policy questions around where does the BRICS also start to fit in with an expansion and where does South Africa articulate its kind of identical and uh, uh, foreign policy orientation. And finally, I think we have to understand that right now there's the U.S. South Africa engagement, which is fraught with all kinds of different issues that are under, uh, underpinning its undercurrents. And we have our Minister of Trade, Industry and Competition attending the AGOA revo review, talking about South Africa's foreign policy but also trying to perhaps uh, look at South Africa in terms of what its economic diplomacy is. So I hope in, in, in terms of our Q&A and our more moderated discussion, we'll touch more on these points because I think it needs to be fleshed out in a much more contextual and in a much more clearer, coherent way in terms of where do we see the pulse points and the checkpoints in South African foreign policy going forward under this GNU. Thank you. Uh, and uh, next, I'd like to ask uh, former Ambassador Peter Pham, would you uh, give us your remarks, sir? Well, th thank you very much, uh, 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 Charlie, and uh, to FPRI for organizing this discussion. Um, I, I couldn't agree more with uh, Sanusha and her and the comments about the domestic uh, dynamic, which led to the election results and uh, which lead to this reordering of South Africa's uh, body politic in a uh, new structure and a new form that is really still taking shape. Although the point I would make would be, although domestic considerations were paramount, both in the election and in the formation of the government of national unity or whatever one chooses to uh, denominate it, it's the foreign policy that's going to impact the ability to achieve some of those domestic uh, uh, objectives, especially the ones uh, perhaps dearer and nearer to the uh, appeal of the Democratic Alliance, the largest party after the ANC uh, in this coalition, uh, which has focused its campaign primarily on internal governance issues and improving the economy. But that is only going to happen with respect to uh, South Africa being able to expand its footprint and economically on the global stage. And that's where, uh, as Sanusha alluded, relations with the U.S. are particularly fraught. Uh, one of the considerations is the foreign policy, which the DA really didn't acquire a role or necessarily bargain for a role uh, in the formation of the unity government. But it's going to impact because the current trajectory of South Africa foreign policy, without getting uh, into it, just listing some of the issues that become irritants in the bilateral relationship, the relationship with the BRICS, uh, the relationship with Russia and China in particular on a strategic level, uh, the bringing of the International Court of Justice case uh, against Israel in the midst of its response to uh, the Hamas terrorist attacks of October 7th, all of which have proven to be additional irritants in an already somewhat fraught 
relationship uh, between the two countries. And we're in the middle in the United States of the renewal process for the Africa Growth and Opportunity Act, the concessionary trade benefit regime that South Africa is by far the largest single beneficiary of. Uh, last year, accounting for almost $3 billion of value added imports uh, uh, to the or exports to the United States imported into America. And that's up for renewal. Uh, and in the midst of that, there's also legislation that was introduced and has passed the House of Representatives Foreign Affairs Committee, introduced by the chair of the Africa Subcommittee, Representative John James of Michigan, to uh, review on a comprehensive level U.S. relations with the South Africa, uh, look with an eye toward the uh, whether South Africa qualifies under the AGOA trade concessions, because one of the criteria is doing nothing to undermine U.S. foreign policy interests or security. Uh, and one could argue that uh, some of South Africa's foreign policy choices do go against U.S. foreign policy interests. Uh, irrespective of whether that piece of legislation is passed, Mr. James has also introduced bits and pieces within uh, the National Defense Authorization Act, a must piece pass of legislation, to begin parts of that review. So there are a number of things going on. And then, of course, there's the issue of the elections, the presidential and uh, congressional elections here in the United States, which will impact uh, both the renewal of a GOA as a whole a program and specifically South Africa's continuing uh, benefiting from that uh, irrespective of the election results. So a, quite a number of foreign policy issues which don't relate directly to the uh, dynamics of the South African elections, but which will impact ultimately uh, the government of national unity's ability to deliver on some of its economic agenda. So the number of issues to discuss, I look forward to that discussion uh, in the moderated discussion. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, and uh, next I'd like to ask Bob Wakesa from uh, the uh, University of Witwatersrand. Uh, would you care to give your remarks, Bob? Thank you, Ambassador Ray, and thanks uh, fellow panelists and the audience. I think uh, I will um, start off by uh, observing that uh, this is not necessarily the first time that we have a government of national unity in South Africa. And without necessarily going into the details too much, there might be examples that emanate from the government of national unity of 1994, which was established after the, an interim constitution that was passed the previous year of 1993, in which the National Party, led by Frederick de Klerk, entered into partnership with the ANC of Mandela, then uh, very, you know, the so-called, uh, you know, Rainbow Nation days, as well as the IFP, Qatar Freedom Party. Uh, that GNU fell apart only two years later, in 1996, as a new proper constitution was uh, inaugurated, with the National Party actually moving out uh, I mean, the National Party being white dominated, of course, uh, you know, due to, you know, major disagreements over matters of policy and running of government. And even then, the you know, the Truth and Justice, the Truth, Justice and Reconciliation Commission issues. I mean, just the fallout there. Of course, IFP remained on board until 1999. Uh, so one wonders if uh, the current GNU is going to go full term or there will be some irreconcilable differences midway that make it impossible, for example, for the DA to continue being uh, in partnership with the ANC. I think that's one observation, uh, you know, worth, uh, you know, discussing. The next point I would like to make as part of the introduction is um, that I think you have to pay attention to the configuration of the GNU as it is, particularly on the clusters of ministries around, or departments for that matter, around that deal with foreign policy. Um, and, and so in this particular respect, overall, the ANC, as uh, my colleague Sanusha pointed out, garnered about 40% of the vote. But in the, in the cabinet portfolio, it actually garnered 55%. 
which is well above uh, its vote count. The DA got about 22% of the electoral vote, but now controls about 30% of the cabinet, uh, or, which is the national executive for that matter. So it will appear that um, uh, these uh, two parties, and of course even IFP also got about only 3% of the electoral vote, but uh, 6% of the cabinet uh, positions or, or, or slots. So, so I, I think this is worth observing because uh, the representation of the AC, ANC in the cabinet at least is way above the popular vote it gave. And so is the case with the DA. That actually brings into play the parties that are out there, the opposition parties. I think my colleague Sanusha mentioned them, Kondo, Sizwe, MK, and uh, you know, economic freedom fighters. So in foreign policy terms, we are then going to see the prosecution of matters foreign policy quite a bit, the contestations in parliament by the opposition parties. Um, should the GNU hold all the way, um, the, 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 these two parties will perhaps just be, to use uh, Ambassador Farm's words, they will be irritants, uh, but again, they will speaking, be speaking to the populace with an eye on the midterm elections or the local government elections in 2026 and perhaps the next election. But if you look at uh, the foreign policy portfolio specifically, which is an indication of uh, who will have an upper hand in matters international relations and diplomacy, the ANC has the presidency. It also has the minister and the two deputies in the Department of International Relations and Cooperation. That kind of will indicate some kind of continuity, even if it might be contested, particularly because a government of national unity is uh, negotiated, uh, kind of a give and take um, uh, arrangement. But once you, you start going further down into the other ministries or other departments that deal with foreign policy, you realize uh, a mix there. In the energy portfolio, for example, where we have uh, minerals and petroleum is under ANC, we have uh, electricity and energy, which is a shared, uh, with the minister is ANC, the deputy minister is uh, DA, um, we, we, we have environment which is in the hands of the, uh, of, um, of, of the DA, meaning that they'll, be, they'll play a, a pivotal role, for example, in the United Nations Framework Agreement on Environment, uh, the, the, the Conference of Parties and so forth. So I think there might be schisms there. When you go to the uh, other foreign policy ministries, particularly in the trade and investment, uh, again, the ANC has an upper hand, but it's checkmated by the DA. So I think in terms of going forward um, uh, with the GNU, the inflection points, the points of friction will be on how the foreign policy portfolios, the direct ones, the explicit ones, which are uh, home affairs under DA, uh, the Department of International Relations, the presidency and so forth, how they negotiate positions, for example, on South Africa's position on the Russia invasion of Ukraine or Ukraine, Russia war, as some people like to frame it, uh, on the issues of Palestine and so forth, on, on relations between South Africa and the BRICS. I, I think the pull and push there will be interesting to observe. Thank you very much. Thank you. And finally, last but certainly not least, Paul Nantulier from National Defense University. Welcome, Paul. Uh, your comments, please. Thank you, Ambassador. Thank you, Ambassador Ray. It's a pleasure to be on board. Um, and uh, I would also like to um, uh, extend extend my 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 greetings uh, to the other to the other panelists, um, uh, Ambassador Peter Pham, uh, Bob Wakesa, and Sanusha Naidu, both of whom I've worked with on other on other programs. Um, I, I would just basically say three things. Uh, one, when I when I look at the uh, composition of the of the of the of the government of national unity or stroke coalition government as uh, some people in South Africa are are putting it, um, it is quite clear that uh, uh, old 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 jackets are difficult to shed off, and we see this in the behavior of the ANC and also of the other parties uh, you know that are part of this uh, uh, government. The ANC, to me, when one looks at the statements that have been made, when one looks at the positioning and the maneuvers um, 
that the party has undertaken, uh, if one listens very carefully to uh, the foreign policy, the major foreign policy speech that uh, Ronald Lamola gave at the South African Institute of International Affairs, it is clear uh, that the ANC uh, is still conducting itself as a majority party, as a party that is uh, hegemonic, and a party that uh, that is driving uh, the political uh, process in South Africa. Um, that speech did not uh, deviate um, at all, in my opinion, from the strong foreign policy positions uh, that the previous government took when it came to issues of uh, of uh, the uh, Israel-Palestine situation. And indeed, Ronald Lamola uh, is one of the key architects of the case that went before the International Court of Justice and the International Criminal Court. That was really front and center. The mention of uh, Western Sahara and other ANC members have been very, very vocal about this, about that continuation of uh, South Africa and stroke the ANC's position on the question of Western Sahara. And I found it very interesting uh, to see that uh, former President uh, Halema Motlante uh, was dispatched to Beijing uh, to talk to the Chinese leadership just around the time that uh, this uh, new gov these new government arrangements were being negotiated. And I suppose the purpose of that trip was to reassure the Chinese side uh, because he was received by senior officials from the Communist Party's uh, international department and uh, the Politburo um, and other and other elements uh, within 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 the Chinese um, uh, system uh, to reassure them that uh, you know there was going to be continuity in the relationship between uh, South Africa and China and between the ANC and the Communist Party, uh, which have signed quite a number of agreements, including on governance, peace and security, police cooperation, and so on. Uh, I haven't found any. Um, public uh, comment on whether uh, Halema Motlante has had uh, discussions with his Russian uh, with the Russian with the Russian side but one would not be one would not be surprised um, uh, given the highly public uh, visit uh, that he took uh, to Beijing uh, during during this uh, moment so we see the ANC uh, continuing uh, you know to want to basically close ranks around these positions and to have an element of continuity uh, when it comes to its uh, relationships with these uh, with these other um, um, uh, on these other foreign policy issues, which of course create tension with some of the ANC's uh, or South Africa's uh, Western partners. So I think that's the first thing. The second thing is when it comes to the domestic side of things. Again, one sees this contestation. Also, it was very interesting uh, for me to watch the uh, parliamentary discussions that took place uh, at centering on the appointment of uh, uh, John Schlope, who is the parliamentary leader of Umkontowesi's party uh, in parliament. Basically, he's now the leader of the official opposition. Uh, this is a gentleman who, uh, actually for the first time since uh, 1994, uh, who, who's who, who was removed uh, from being from being a senior justice uh, due to a uh, investigations around uh, corruption and other controversies, um, uh, and uh, it was interesting to see that the ANC, the EFF, and uh, Umkontowesi's way party came together uh, to vote him in as a member of the uh, Ju Judicial Service Commission, the very body that removed him. Uh, from office, and I spoke with a a former um, co-worker of mine uh, during my time in South Africa, and uh, and he said, you know, for a second, it felt that the ANC was still in charge, and that there was no difference, and that the political environment was still the same, the kind of political environment that we've been used to since 1994. So I found that I found that to be very interesting particularly given the very um, uh, caustic uh, uh, statements uh, that John Schlope himself made, um, you know, criticizing uh, President Ramaphosa and uh, essentially labeling him a sellout and, you know, that sort of thing. So that was very interesting. That was very interesting indeed to see. 
The third and final element, uh, which I guess is still evolving and which will definitely impact the domestic environment ahead of the uh, local government elections, which is going to be very, very important and might even be the barometer for the next general election, is, you know, and quite a number of South African uh, commentators have uh, taken note of this. When you combine the ANC vote, the MK, uh, Umkontowesi Iswe party, and uh, the EFF, it comes to about 65% of the entire electorate. And people like Roger Southall um, have said that uh, what this tells us is that while the ANC's dominance has dwindled, the ANC tradition remains dominant within the South African electoral dynamics and voter constituencies. Uh, that is interesting. Uh, but it is also not new, because if we look back at the previous cycles of all these elections, uh, going all the way back to the breakaway of Bantu Holomisa's UDM from the ANC, one finds that with each election, when one combines the ANC vote and the combined votes of the ANC splinter parties, like COPE, the Congress of the People, and the EFF itself, again, that... Uh, you know, you know, you know, when 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 those votes are aggregated, they constitute a majority. So that then raises certain questions. What is it that South African voters are thinking? What exactly are they voting for? Are they voting for political change? Or are they voting for an ANC program that they felt the ANC veered away from? Uh, and you know, these two dynamics for me are very interesting. And it would be interesting to see how the ANC reacts to this. Uh, what will the ANC do in terms of uh, satisfying um, uh, its, its, its uh, uh, obviously it has got to try and satisfy DA voters, but at the same time, it does have a constituency that dwindled its uh, its its majority, but channeled its votes uh, towards uh, the splinter parties. Very difficult balancing act, and it will be interesting to see what the ANC does about that uh, in the next uh, four to five years. Well, thank you, uh, and to all of the panelists, thank you for some very interesting remarks. I have a few questions uh, before we go to our audience, uh, and if I could. Go first, Peter, to you. Uh, you talked about the, you know, the AGOA Forum, which is taking place now here in, in Washington. Given uh, two things, one, this government of national unity, and it, it, listening to you all, it doesn't seem to mean that there will be any really significant changes in the political landscape in terms of international relations in South Africa, but also given the political dynamics here in the U.S., the, the current split, if you will, between the two parties over over how to approach foreign relations. What do you think uh, the outcome of this Agora Forum will be in terms of South Africa? How will South Africa fare in these negotiations? Well, uh, thanks for the question, uh, Charlie. The, to be quite frank, I'm not sure why the current Agora Forum is taking place at all. Uh, uh, much less uh, what will come out of it. The reason I say that, quite frankly, is that if we look at the number of legislative days that the current U.S. Congress will have, we're, Congress will be in session barely 30 days uh, between now and the end of the year. And with that, uh, with the priority of passing spending bills to keep the, federal, the U.S. federal government functioning, plus for the Senate getting judicial nominations and uh, through uh, uh, the Senate, there's going to be f no bandwidth in reality to pass the renewal of AGOA. And I think the fact that it does not technically ex expire as much as the business community would like certainty well in advance, technically expire until the end of September, 2025. I doubt that AGOA renewal, all the legislation has been introduced uh, will actually pass this year. So that's one. Secondly, 
uh, co the composition of Congress that will take up the AGOA renewal will be changed, perhaps even dramatically, uh, depending on the results of the election. And certainly we will have, now we are certain, a change of administration, whether that be President Trump reelected or Vice President Harris uh, elected to uh, as the new president. Either way, there's going to be a change. So in, in many respects, all the interlocutors are going to change uh, and nothing's going to really happen this year, point one. However, uh, so to speak to South Africa particularly, I note that uh, the trade and cooperation uh, minister, Parks Tau, is in town for the AGOA Forum. He's using the opportunity to engage and to lobby against the legislation uh, I mentioned earlier introduced by the chairman of the House Subcommittee on Africa, John James, to review comprehensively U.S.-South Africa relations. Uh, it's a very interesting position because he's lobbying not for a specific piece of legislation or change, but for even reviewing it, which I think speaks to what Bob and Paul have mentioned, which is there's very little change to be anticipated in South African foreign policy. And that, to me, is going to be problematic. We already have a bipartisan emerging consensus that something is dreadfully wrong, that the relationship is unbalanced, and that concessionary trade preferences given to a country that regularly opposes US interests uh, need to be really closely examined. Uh, if I could venture a prediction, I would say that the, the creation of the government of national unity, the entrance of the DA into government, the fact that the DA as an opposition party previously engaged in four separate missions to the US uh, to try to advocate for South Africa because many of the value added uh, uh, industries that benefit from AGOA trade preferences are located in the Western Cape. Uh, this will buy them what you know some could describe as a honeymoon for the government of national unity, but it just puts off a day of reckoning. And I think uh, whether, depending on the results of our no US uh, elections in November, that reckoning will come quickly or it will come more gradually. But sometime next year, I think AGOA will be renewed. And then I think the sequence will be South Africa's continuing to benefit from it or not, given its foreign policy trajectory, which listening to my fellow panelists who know and are much more familiar with internal South African dynamics, looks unlikely to change. I, I think it's a real question mark whether a year, year and a half from now, South Africa, even a renewed AGOA, will continue to be uh, found eligible, uh, irrespective of uh, the results of the U.S. election. Oh, thank you. Uh, I have a question here. Uh, this is for either uh, Anusha or Bob, uh, and and this is something that, as as I read news articles coming out of South Africa and and other parts of the continent that comment on this, uh, this government of national unity, uh, South Africa's new political formation, is this really a unified? government or or is it just a shotgun wedding can i can i uh, paul's hand yes. yeah let paul go and then yes and then that's it thank you thank okay. you um look uh first of all uh, ambassador fan I, I i i do agree i do agree with your assessment um that uh even in the, even in the um in the most contentious of of times uh, such as the uh, you know this the you know the the allegation that um, that something untoward in terms of arms shipments took place between South Africa and Russia, uh, uh, and there was a, there was a really massive fallout between between the two countries as a result of that you know the Lady R incident uh, in 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 the Western Cape you know where it was alleged that uh, some weapons were offloaded onto a Russian ship. Um, but even at that time, the South Africans sent a high-level team uh, to the United States, actually several times, uh, to try and persuade the United States 
uh, not to take action that would result in the loss of AGOA benefits. Uh, and, uh, you know, Naledi Pando, the former minister, uh, uh, you know, spoke on many forums, uh, right, trying to trying to push for, you know, a, a, a whole concept of let's uh, let's agree to disagree, but let's uh, let's continue, you know, this relationship. So clearly it is a relationship that uh, that even the ANC as a party values. Uh, and it would be it would be interesting to see how the ANC balances that going forward, especially given um what we have seen uh, in 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 recent in in recent weeks, um, but let me also just, you know, getting back to Ambassador Ray's uh, point, um, I think it will all depend on which strain of thought, which school of thought becomes dominant uh, within 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 the ANC, because there are some in the ANC and uh, you know some elements close to the ANC that have basically said that to them, this is really not a government of national unity. This is a temporary sort of a tactical, tactical two steps back to try and reassess the political environment and to see to it that the DA uh, uh, loses its, uh, its, uh, its, 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 its constituency and that the DA eventually um, uh, becomes, uh, you know, quote unquote, and I'm using words that were communicated to me, extinguished uh from the political from the political scene and i think they're thinking back to uh the nnp because the african national congress brought the new national party which was sort of like the rebranded national party the party that ruled south africa during apartheid uh, during the apartheid era and brought them into brought them into government and actually had a coalition with them um and what happened with the new national party is that it was badly punished by its voters and basically fizzled out of the political environment altogether. I think the the uh, the, the person who led the NNP into the ANC's uh, governing arrangement, uh, and I think this was during, uh, if I recall, this was during Thabo Mbeki's uh, time, uh, was is is was you know he became a uh, a cabinet minister. You know there were some ministries that were shared with the ANC. Uh, and was even deployed as a as as a senior diplomat. In fact, I think he's still he was still a diplomat uh, ahead of ahead of uh, ahead of the previous elections. Uh, Martinez von Skalpvik. So there are some in the ANC that are thinking about that and think that they might be that they might have an opportunity to do the same thing to the Democratic Alliance. So yeah, you know the question you know the question then remains: Does the ANC see this as as a GNU? Uh, or does it see it as a, you know, just, I mean, this is just a political terrain. They're going to get better. They're going to get the better of the DA. I think there's some in the ANC that were really happy with, the, with what they're calling uh, the, the outmaneuvering that, you know, the DA was outmaneuvered because, you know, they wanted the presidency. They wanted other ministries. They wanted foreign affairs that they were not able to, you know, to secure. And even within, even within agriculture, uh, the component for land reform and land restitution was taken away and given to the Pan-Africanist Congress, which is even more, uh, 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 you know, controversial and even more radical than the ANC when it comes to the issue of land and the issue of land restitution. So, again, you know, the jury is out as to whether this is really a government of national unity in the thinking of some within the African National Congress. Can I just jump in on this on this? on these very important points, uh, Ambassador Ray. I think what Paul is saying is very fundamental because it is also about trying to understand the thinking behind what constitutes the GNU of 94, which Bob had sketched out, and what constitutes, and I put in inverted commas, the GNU of 2024. In the run-up to this election, there was a lot of interesting election campaigning. It was very combatant. I mean, the DA and the ANC were, I mean, the, the DA was constantly nipping at the heels of the ANC in a very um, combative way in terms of not being able to have that program of development, which Paul alluded to earlier, as part of the reconstruction and development, the transformation, um, and the whole question about key policy issues when it came to the transformation of people's lives and livelihoods. 
at the same time, I think, you know, the ANC found itself in a very difficult position because it was a 30 year anniversary. And the question was, how did you get here 30 years later? Yes, you may have delivered on some of your election promises over the 30 years, over the six um, elections that was that were had. But have you really qualitatively improve people's lives. And I see in the chat, uh, in the Q&A rather, there's a question about the youth vote. And I think the youth vote is critical to where we are right now, because the question is, what does the youth vote constitute in South Africa? And did they come out to vote? So are they that kind of generation that we're seeing around the world who is now saying, we're not going to be that that the, those people that are going to have their lives mortgaged in the way that it has? But I think what's also important to bear in mind is the question around this GNU and whether it was, and I say this with all um, uh, uh, levels of, of not knowing what the inner workings are, but from just where I'm sitting, it depends whether the GNU was, was configured for five years or was it configured for two years? Because there's a very important election happening in 2026, and that is the local government election. Now, what's very interesting about South African politics is we don't domesticate foreign policy issues in our electoral politics, in our electoral uh, landscape. In fact, if you look at the manifestos, of most of the political parties, it's very light, if not almost uh, completely muted on foreign policy. And so what's interesting is the foreign policy is really embedded within the policy architecture and the policy making of our investment, uh, our attraction in terms of our credit ratings, uh, how do we deal with our policy certainty? How do we actually create fiscal stability? Um, how do we deal with the challenges of, of poverty, inequality, and unemployment? And those are serious uh, uh, questions that are linked to the kind of the program of development, which everybody was trying to do in terms of a transactional approach. We promised this, we promised that, and we, we will ensure that we increase the social welfare grant to the aged, uh, aged for, the, for, for the children, et cetera. But at the same time, not looking at what your fiscus is about. So what we actually have to ask ourselves is, why was this, what is the time frame of this GNU? Because a lot of the debates in South Africa is really how fast this GNU has to hit the ground running. At the same time, if you look at the portfolios, and I like the way Bob sketched out the 55% of government positions that go to the ANC, the 30% to the DA, and of course, there's around about 6% to the, to, to, to the IFP or thereabouts. But what's interesting is that all of these ministries in this GNU have to work together. And so the key issue right now is whether or not there is a policy coherence around policy making and policy articulation. And the center feature of this GNU is what it's going to do from now till next year, because next year these political parties will go into election mode again for local government elections, which will happen in 2026. And so the question would be, do they coalesce as a government of national unity and partners around key policy issues, which link back to the foreign policy question and the question of Goa and other kind of uh, trade agreements and relationships and the economic diplomacy question? And, or will they become much more combative like they've been previously? The second issue really is the fact that we have the DTI minister in, in, in Washington right now trying to, 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 to talk about our foreign policy um, and really try, and, and, and we did have Minister Lamola there as well, not so long ago, I think. Uh, but what's interesting is that this review that has been referenced a lot is also a review based on the idea that South Africa is irritating US foreign policy because we seem to be wanting to be independent in our thinking. And that's the other issue about the foreign policy architecture. It's the ideological issues about where we are. And some in the South African landscape actually find it irritating as well from the US being so prescriptive. And that irritation comes out, whether it's DERCO or the Department of International Relations, where you saw uh, Minister Lamola say, there's a continuity. These are the rules that were set. 
why can't these rules of the international system be applied? Now, we know that there's a question being raised also about South African foreign policy and consistency around this rules-based system. But the challenge is around how do you deal with Western Sahara? How do you deal with Sudan, which is really an important issue and, and, and something that needs to be discussed much more uh, clearly and, and cohesively. But at the same time, the question is, I, I think where we're finding ourselves is, is, is what aspects of the foreign policy are we talking about? There's the normative aspect, there's the international rules-based system, there's the law, there's the humanitarian law question. At the On the other hand is the foreign economic policy dimensions and the ministries within our cabinet have to find that hook to work with each other. And that is going to be key because if the DTIC minister Parks Tao is in Washington, then there has to be a coordinated effort. And I think that is what the GNU is trying to do. So we heard this week from the from the president about the response to his state of the parliament address that was last week on Nelson Mandela's birthday on the 18th of July. But we also heard questions coming out of parliament about oversight over the presidency, over key uh, issues and key policy, but also issues related to now that we don't have a Department of Public Enterprises, all the state-owned enterprises seem to now have fallen into the bandwidth of the presidency. Does that What does that do in terms of the relationship between the presidency and the GNU cabinet? I think on the DA, there's another question around the DA. How much does the DA also have to make this GNU work? because it also has to think about its own constituency. Even if it did really well in this election, according to the fact that it didn't lose votes, it never really, really moved the needle. And so because the ANC also came down by 17%, and it's quite surprising that you know the, the other debate in South Africa around the ANC as well is what happens next year, the ANC will go through an internal review. And there are questions about these dynamics around how they performed in the 2024 election. And these are critical questions for the kind of continuity within the ANC around the different dynamics around um, the leadership question and so forth. And so for the DA as well, I think the question would be similarly, but it will also be about the fact that the DA now has to make this GNU work because also it has it has given, given given portfolios which align to some of the serious crisis of governance and economic issues. In these, in these portfolios, whether it's home affairs, dealing with the visa issue, whether it's uh, the question of public works and infrastructure, dealing with internal problems around the public uh, infrastructure and works departments, uh, questions around the uh, wage, uh, the, the, the public administration sector, which deals with the public sector unions and the wage bill. These are all interesting dynamics that have been given to the DA, but also to the IFP. So I think for me, it's not just an ANC issue. It is a GNU issue of these major parties within the GNU or within this broad coalition and how they have to think about where they go to in 2026 and what happens to that kind of vote. The last point I want to make on, on AGOA, I think it's fascinating that AGOA and, and the review of the South African and US relations has reached this point. And, and to just pick up on, on, on what Paul was saying, I think recently Ambassador Brigitte, the US ambassador, did an interview with one of the local media. And he made a very interesting point. He talked about the resetting of the relationship. He talked about he sees this relationship now kind of galvanizing towards this kind of spa uh, kind of engagement. I'm, I'm, I'm wondering whether there are different spaces within the US context, as, as we see in South Africa, who have different reactions to this, because the sense you get talking from the business sector, like the business sector, I think, in, in, in South Africa and in the US, is they want to see this work very importantly. It's important in terms of how it's being defined. But again, the challenge is how do different voices articulate, conceptualize, and create this kind of um, of, 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 of irritants within the relationship itself. Well, uh, uh, Charlie, if I can make a very brief clarification, two very quick clarifications. One, I think South Africans are very want to always cite sovereignty, independence, and all those questions. Fine. But sovereignty has its consequences. And South Africa has made some, what to the U.S., are very clear, stark, and controversial foreign policy choices, and that's its sovereign right to do. But AGOA is a concessionary program. It's one way. It allows South Africa and other beneficiaries 
to export duty-free value-added products to the United States, uh, unlike other countries that have tariffs imposed on them. It's a concession. And so the United States is also a sovereign country and has a right to decide and will decide whether a country that regularly frustrates our foreign policy agenda should be given a friends and family discount, if you will, in the free trade. Exporting last year almost $3 billion of Finnish value-added products, including automobile engines, wines, and other uh, goods to the United States without tariffs. And I think that's where the imbalance in the relationship is. And because it's not a bilateral trade agreement, I think it's something that is going to be subject to review. And in the political climate of the United States, where both parties are talking about rebuilding an industrial base, bringing manufacturing back to the United States, the political case domestically within the United States for giving tariff-free access to a country that frustrates us on foreign policy instead of simply reshoring those jobs, that case is not going to be very compelling irrespective of whether one is a Republican or a Democrat. And I think that's the part, the one-way nature, the asymmetry that's going to uh, be a serious issue in the year ahead. Okay, thank you. Uh, I was going to get to you, Bob, but we'd like to get to at least a couple of questions from from the audience. Yes. I, I think we have probably done this uh, when well. Uh, here's a question. Uh, the, the reality of South Africa is that the overwhelmingly uh, an overwhelming proportion of the population is black and not sure that the ANC has achieved much to address the disparities or divides. What can we expect from this new unified government, Bob? No, I, I think um, the, the, the interesting perspective there is uh, not just to look at the GNU, or the government of national unity alone, but look at uh, the opposition parties, uh, MK, Mkondo Sizu and EFF. Um, I think as, and I think this also builds on to what my colleagues have said that the test of the GNU is going to come into sharp relief very soon. As soon as we go into budget making, uh, we, saw, we, we, we go into rolling out of programs. Uh, for instance, uh, I think there's a, a colleague who has argued very passionately, when less in in fact, that the South African public service, for example, is bloated. Uh, it consumes quite a big percentage of the national budget. Now, on an issue such as that, the ANC will argue that we need jobs for blacks. And one way to do that is to have a big civil service that assures that in any case, the idea of retrenching uh, you know, the, the middle class in the civil service will be political suicide for the ANC. On the other hand, you'll have the DA that is austerity focused that wants a lean government, one that is pro-business and so forth. That is just one example of, of an inflection that perhaps is going to burst on the scene not too long from, from here. Uh, and, and on the basis of uh, conflicts over how, where to spend, uh, do we spend on the people? Do we spend on affirmative action programs? Do we retain things like the broad-based uh, Black economic empowerment or you know, tinker with it, change it so that it's less fraud, less uh, given to corruption and sleaze and so forth? Or do we go to business first, focused on good economics, let the economy kind of sort out, uh, you know, issues, you know, social issues uh, more broadly? In, in that mix, in parliament, you have the EFF and the MK that are actually lo looking to undercut the ends. In fact, the MK did very well, 14% within a short span. It was established only in December, and it has done well uh, at elections in May. So they might be looking at it and saying, look, we we actually the true representatives of the black majority. They will be saying, look, the ANC of Ramaphosa, as it's called, is a sellout. They went with your, in with your oppressors. In fact, there's quite a major racial issue here. Uh, there, there are people who are rapidly anti-white, 
And of course, there are some whites who are rapidly under a black. So I, th I think uh, those um, uh, issues are going to come into play uh, uh, pretty fast. And I think the short answer to the question is that indeed the GNU will find it very difficult to kind of fulfill the, 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 the promise, you know, the unemployment, the high unemployment the, the levels uh, and, and so forth. But, uh, but allow me, Ambassador Ray, to also jump in on the question of uh, uh, US-South Africa relations. I think one major point is that the US has also not quite understood South Africa. Uh, you know, well, I, and I hear uh, Ambassador Farm pretty well, uh, that every entity must take care of it, its interests. But if, if, for example, we continued with this legislation to review South Africa relations, South Africa-US relations, it might actually end up pushing South Africa further and further into the BRICS, making South Africa a swing state, uh, you know, you know, you know, and, and you know, make the relations more fractious. Fortunately, I think the presence of the DA in the coalition might be a moderating factor. And if we have voices of reason, we'll then go towards negotiated agreement on um, uh, how, we, how South Africa and the US relate internationally. Uh, because, because I, I think uh, ultimately the South Africans, uh, particularly from the ANC end of things, argue that they are looking for economic benefit. Of course, it's been mentioned that Agua is one such. But when they look at their you know, trade engagements with, say, China, Russia, India, and so forth, and compare with the US, trade volume alone tells you a different story. So it, it, it might end up being like, where do we go from here? So, so I, I want to imagine that there will be voices of reason that come into the gap and uh, you know, clearly look at what we can do together, even as uh, we remain, uh, we, we, we take different routes on some certain issues. I'll stop there. Thank you. OK. Thank you. Uh, you know, so far we've been another combining two questions. We've been discussing uh, the impact of the GNU on South Africa's relations uh, with uh, Russia, China, and the U.S. Uh, but what what are the impact of uh, what is the impact of this new government structure on South Africa's relationships with the rest of Africa, especially given uh, South Africa's traditional leading role on the continent? Who would like to take a stab at that? Uh, Paul? Um, uh, okay, let me, uh, why does, uh, let Sanusha go first and then, and then, and then I'll say something uh, after that. Thank you. I, I think it does need um, a little bit more traction. Um, the, the Africa policy or the African uh, context of South Africa's engagements in its foreign policy is is on the African side has gone through ebbs and flows and it hasn't really sustained itself. I mean, in in the Jacob Zuma years, it was very difficult to 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 pick out uh, key dynamics. I mean, it played a from a from a from a quantitative perspective, it hit all the right tones, but in terms of the impact that it had from over a series of 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 of, of uh, of time from the Mandela years to Mbeki and then of course thereafter to Zuma and now with uh, President uh, Ramaphosa, it's kind of ebbed and flowed. And I think this GN, this government uh, moving forward will have to be much more uh, clearer about what are the pulse points, the checkpoints, the, the the key dynamics around its Africa policy, particularly in terms of its relation, its engagements around its peace, security, stability, development, but also the fact that South Africa now shares a platform with the African Union in the G20. Um, one of the cornerstones of of of, of looking at South African for uh, Africa policy is the fact that it constantly looks at itself as also being that kind of um, actor that's bringing the agency to the African continent. Now you're having a kind of shift in that, particularly along the lines of members like um, Ethiopia that has joined the BRICS. We're not sure what the next expansion or iteration of expansion of the BRICS will look like, but if it does uh, uh, br bring more African countries into the BRICS, then South Africa does have to think about what its Africa policies tends to, 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 to consolidate around. And, 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 and one one of the immediate ones would be the fact that South Africa will be taking on the uh, the chairing of the G20 in December of this year, and having the African Union 
uh, being part of that will mean that you'll have to coordinate your 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 efforts there. So I think there's there's a there's also the idea of how Africa sees us, and I'd like to 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 leave that to Paul to 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 look at as well or to shed light on that because there's also the questions about how South Africa deals with the issues of economic migrants from other African countries, the question of uh, issues of of uh, of, of uh, how it deals with the with 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 the visa the 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 the, the skills work issue uh, and whether or not we're going to see shifts and changes in that and we do have big expat communities from African commun uh, African countries that are in South Africa and there is that challenge in terms of where South Africa is in terms of its formalized Africa policy but also what happens at the domestic level as well um thank you thank you uh, quick yes thank you Thank you, sister. Thank you, sister Sanusha. Um, yes, I think I think uh, the African side will be will be key going forward. Uh, the the ANC and, and South Africa uh, have uh, have a long standing long standing position uh, of uh, placing the African continent at the center of foreign policy and foreign engagements. Uh, Ronald Lamola's uh, speech at the South African Institute of International Affairs. I keep referring back to it. Um, uh, he was very insistent, very, very insistent that Africa policy would would, would be consolidated under this new uh, governing governing arrangement, and that South Africa was going to continue to lift Africa at the international level. In terms of how that is perceived on the African continent, I think uh, it you know you know I'll, I'll mention three strands. There's one strand uh, that is basically one of frustration that South Africa uh, doesn't uh, play uh, or no longer plays the kind of role that it once played uh, during the Mandela period and the early Tabombeki period, you know, the whole African Renaissance. Uh, and, you know, South Africa made some really heavy, heavy, heavy wins, uh, you know, negotiating the Burundi uh, talks and uh, the Congolese talks and others. Um, there's been a sense that South Africa has kind of shied away from that role. And there are those on the African uh, continent that would want South Africa to resume, uh, you know, to sort of reclaim uh, that 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 uh, that, that vantage that vantage uh, position. But then there are also others that are frustrated with, for instance, things like immigration. Right? Uh, we all know that South Africa has a very tough immigration policy, a uh, very tough policy when it comes to asylum uh, seekers. Uh, there are problems, uh, you know, with the with outbreaks of. Uh, you know, these xenophobic uh, attacks against African immigrants, against African migrants. Uh, there's a party there in South Africa, uh, the PA, um, which is in the government of national unity, and it had been lobbying very heavily uh, to take control of the home affairs portfolio that handles immigration, uh, which is uh, openly, openly uh, anti-African immigrant. In fact, uh, their leader, Peter McKenzie, uh, was talking about building a wall uh, building a wall on South Africa's borders to keep African immigrants out, uh, you know, this this sort of thing. So there's frustration around that uh, 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 as well. And I guess that also impacts on uh, what South Africa can do and in terms of how South Africa can be, as how South Africa is perceived on, their, on the rest of the African continent. But then there's also another dimension to it, namely that South Africa is seen as an inspiration. How many African, in how many African elections can you have a governing party that sees itself on the verge of losing its majority, and A, does not switch off the internet, does not round up opposition opposition parties and uh, keep them under house arrest, does not abduct uh, opposition, opposition uh, uh, parties and supporters, does not deploy armored personnel carriers and tanks on the streets uh, to intimidate voters, and does not basically stop the counting, you know, go to the election commission and tell the election commission to stop the count and then uh, get the judges uh, that are co-opted in the political system to announce fake and fraudulent results. I'm not being dramatic. This is what we see in election after election after election on the African continent. The ANC did the opposite. South African political parties did the opposite. So there are those on the African side that actually think that what has happened in South Africa with this formation of the governments of national unity, as it is being called by some, and a humbled ANC that has accepted the result actually strengthens South Africa's credentials uh, on the African continent because this is a path that other political parties ought to follow. And then, of course, there's the liberation movements that are seeing this as a danger 
and which will lock in and say, you know what, we're not going to let this happen to us. So I think, uh, you know, these are the four different elements that we see on the African continent. And, uh, uh, you know, I think the, uh, uh, you know, this election result reverberates around Africa and is going to have an impact on African politics for very many years to come. Well, thank you and thank you all. I must apologize to those of our audience whose questions we didn't get around to. We've come to the end of this. Uh, I'd like to remind you that this will, the recording of this panel discussion will be on YouTube within 24 to 48 hours. Uh, if those of you in the audience who wish to share it with your friends are, are encouraged to do so, I'd like once again to thank our four panelists for an outstanding and very in-depth discussion of a subject that could be, we could be discussing for hours and still probably not reach the, the end of of things to be said. Uh, I ask you to remember FPRI and the Africa program as you are making your donations to worthy causes and look forward to seeing all of you again uh, at some future point in time. Uh, thank you and have a nice day. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you so much.